What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of the sit down. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit the like button and let me know what you think of today's very interesting discussion in the comment section below. If you're new around here, you just haven't done it yet, or you're living under a rock and seeing this video for the first time, I don't know what you're waiting for. Hit that subscribe button below now so you never miss another sit down video. Also, make sure you check out our friends at Pravada Cigar Club. Dot com. We have a signature sit-down cigar coming, an exclusive, which will be ready very soon. I'll let you know when it's available at Pravada Cigar Club. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get into another very interesting organized crime topic. And over the years, we've heard a lot about one-man armies, people that are on their own. They go out the mafia, they steal, they pillage, and they ruin communities. There are certain people that have defied the mob over the years, and we've all heard their names. It's not good to be a revolutionary against the mob. Generally, you end up six feet under. In Howard Beach, Queens, this individual is known to be a notorious person. His name is Chris Cognata. We talk about the life and times of the man they called a one-man crime wave. And in the 2000s, he would go to war with members of the Bonanno crime family. The very interesting story of Chris Cognata, the man they called Crazy Chris. Next on the sit-down, Chris Cognata was born on Christmas, December 25th, 1985. And he would grow up in and around Howard Beach, Queens, as well as at times living in Lindenwood and Ozone Park. Chris was a Howard Beach kid. It was said by people that knew him that Chris Cognata did not have a great childhood. He would bounce around from home to home with his mother, who was said at one point to have certain substance abuse issues. Now, I'll talk about Chris's father, who, for the most part, was a criminal in his own right, and he wasn't much of an inspiration to Chris. Now, Chris Cognata it was said that his uncle was quite important to the maturation of him. His uncle was a person called Joseph Cavalcanti. Now, Cavalcanti, from what I understand, at one point was a hijacker. In fact, I did find of a Joseph Cavalcanti that in the 70s was busted uh, for hijacking at one of the airports in Queens. Cavalcanti was said to be a guy who was respected by mobsters and kind of ran around doing his own thing. It was also said that Cognata's aunt, a woman called Donna Cavalcanti, was particularly uh, ruthless as well. It was said that she would regularly get into spats with people. In fact, at one point, it was said Donna Cavalcanti would have an argument with the daughter of Vinny Asaro, to which she would hit her over the head with a wine bottle. It was said that Vinny Asaro was so incensed by this, he would order his son to kill Donna Cavalcanti. And he almost did, shooting her four times in a bar called Butterfingers. Now, Donna Cavalcanti would survive. However, she would not identify the person who shot her. And it seems like throughout the life of Chris Cognata, he always felt like he had a chip on his shoulder and didn't always respect the mafia, which we'll get into. Cognata, again, bounced around. It was said that he would at times, at seven, eight, nine years old, be spotted alone at parks in and around Howard Beach, and that certain neighborhood wise guys and criminals would do what they could to make his life better. They would take him for pizza. They would try to teach him and school him. He was always around criminals, though. And again, most of these people's lives are decided for them. According to Ricky Kessler, who, if you know or are from Howard Beach, you know who Ricky Kessler is. Ricky Kessler would tell me himself that he would try to school Cognata and would see him regularly. He would play basketball at a park in Howard Beach, and he would see a young Cognata sitting on benches you know, without any sort of influence around him. He would also tell me a story that at one point, when Cognata was just 10 years old in the mid-'90s, he would take Kessler – uh, Cognata to a pizzeria called La Villa Pizzeria in Howard Beach. He would say that they were outside the pizzeria when Cognata was sitting near the car 
of Carmine the Bull Agnello. Now, Agnello would come out of the pizza shop and basically tell young Cognata to get off his car, to which Cognata would essentially tell Agnello to go fuck himself. This is a 10-year-old kid, and Kessler would tell me that he kind of had to talk Agnello down because this Cognata was a real root rabble route. He was always trying to talk back to people, and he said to the kid, do you know who that is? Like, shut the fuck up, basically. Um, Kessler would say that throughout the life uh, in which he knew Cognati, he was always around him. He tried to kind of school him. They did things on the streets together, um, but that he ultimately always respected Chris Cognata. Now, C Cognata, as I said, his father was a criminal. It was said that uh, Richard Cognata was a burglar, a bank robber. And on May 28th, 1987, Chris Cognata's father, alongside a man named Carmine Moriali, would approach a Loomis armored car and attempt to rob it in Manhattan. Sadly, though, down the street, there were police uh, and they would arrest Moriali and Richard Cognata. Now, Chris's father, Richard, would ultimately serve about five years in federal prison and he would get out in 1992. So around the time that Cognata's father would get out, he was you know, seven, eight years old and his father would actually end up moving to Florida. It was said by the age of 10 or 11, Cognata was a real problem. He decided to go live with his father in Florida for a period of time. He wouldn't last long, though. He would return back to Howard Beach in and around the age of 15 or 16. And by that point, he was very much engaged in criminality. It was said that he was selling drugs. He was ripping and running. And according to very famous mob informant Gene Borello, I asked him about Chris Cognata, and he would say by the time Chris Cognata was 16 years old, he was beating up grown men in and around Howard Beach. Chris Cognata had always been feared, and he had the thing of he just didn't care very much. I don't think he cared much about dying. And by this point in the early 2000s, Cognata was starting to not only gain the respect of people like Kessler, but he was also hanging around Ronnie Gialonzo, Michael Palmacio, and Gene Barella, who remember in the early 2000s, Gene Barella was starting to move around. They were around the same age, him and Cognata. They were moving around in certain circles in Howard Beach. Cognata was the real deal, and he would eventually delve into committing shootings, ripping and running, as well as selling large amounts of drugs, as well as stealing from drug dealers as well. Now, according to Gene Borello, he would tell me of a story that at one point, not only Cognata, but he and Cognata were marked for death after they got into a spat with a person called Philip Galena. He, Gene would tell me that this person, a person called Duca Jean Duke Nikolai, an Albanian, was sent to kill them. Now, I wasn't able to verify this story, but it is something that I did want to throw out there. Cognata was marked for death by a lot of different people, but again, he didn't care. He did what he had to do to survive. Cognata was feared by a lot of people in the area and was a real thorn in the sides of a lot of people. Eventually, his friendly relationship with people like Ronald Gialonzo would go away. And I think ultimately, Chris knew what happened with his aunt many years ago. He knew Ronnie was related to Vinny Asar, and I think he always had the thought of, I just don't give a shit a whole lot about who these people are. I'm going to do what I have to do, and if they need me, they can come get me. He would constantly defy the mafia at every level. Now, in and around 2006, Cognata would go to war with the Bonanno crime family and members of the Bonanno crime family. In and around 2005, 2006, as we know, Ronnie G was a quasi-captain in Howard Beach. His uncle, Vinny Asaro, had kind of put him to work, and Gialonzo was gaining a reputation. He had people in his crew like Michael Paul Maceo, like Gene Borello, people like Ricky Kessler. He also had a person in his crew called Nicholas Festa. Now, Festa, who went by the name Pudgy, was not an enforcer. He was a money man, and he made a lot of money not only selling narcotics, but also putting money on the streets. At one point, it was alleged that Nicholas Festa made $1 million just in interest in money on the streets. Festa was kicking up to his captain, Ronnie Gialonzo. 
But around this time, Festa was getting robbed on a regular basis. It had become common knowledge that Festa was someone who you could rip and run from. Festa was robbed by someone called Ronnie M at one point. I'm working on trying to gain the identity of who Ronnie M is. Um, there was also a point made that at one point, Cognata would rob Festa as well. This would send the Gialonzo camp into an absolute rage. And again, Chris didn't really care much because he never really cared much about the mafia. We can see how close Festa was to Ronnie G. Here Festa can be seen to Ronnie Gialonzo's left with his hands in his pocket with gray sweatpants on. Festa was very respected by Ronnie G. And Ronnie Gialonzo took it as a personal slap in the face to rob Festa. Cagnata was marked for death. The Bananos would get back at Cagnata by allegedly uh, running into a stash house that Cagnata owned in and around Howard Beach. A shootout would ensue, and the two would shoot back and forth. This was a war playing itself out on Howard Beach's quiet streets. Remember, Howard Beach had longly been a place where mobsters lived. John Gotti lived in Howard Beach. Joe Messino lived in Howard Beach. It was a quiet you know, kind of bucolic place. But now you start having these young kids, they're going around shooting each other. Cognata would escape in that whole thing. And at one point he would be stalked. On June 28th, 2006, Ronnie G. Alonzo, according to a federal indictment, would send Gene Borello and Michael Patagonia to take out Mr. Cognata. Now I want to talk about what the indictment says. Now, keep in mind, John Doe number five in the indictment is Chris Cognata. Okay, remember that. John Doe five would tell Ronnie Gialonzo that he was, quote, not involved, but Gialonzo would not believe Cognata. Gialonzo then ordered associate one, who would be Gene Borello, to shoot but not kill Chris Cognata in retaliation for the robbery. Now, Gene Borello did as directed and with other members searched for John Doe 5, a.k.a. Cognata. Now, on one occasion, Gialonzo and defendant Michael Patagonia would drop Associate One Borello and defendant Michael Palmacio outside a residence in which they believed John Doe 5, a.k.a. Cognata, was living and waited for him to come outside. Gialonzo would give both Palmacio and Associate One, a.k.a. Borello, guns, which they stored in the wheel wells of cars parked along the curb. Now, again, according to the indictment, after a few hours of waiting without John Doe 5, Cognata leaving the residence, Gene Barella and Palmacio got back into the car with Patavoni and Gialonzo and left the area. Now, on another occasion, Gene Barella was walking near the apartment in Howard Beach and saw Cognata in a vehicle with John Doe number 5's girlfriend, who was identified as Girlfriend 1. Now, I am not going to identify who Girlfriend 1 is. I know who she is. And I'm not going to put her into this because, in fact, she was actually quite smart in this whole thing. Cognata would be then spotted by Gene Morello. And as he exited a car, Associate One would confront Cognata. It was then said Gene Morello allegedly pulled a gun, walked towards John Doe number five, Cognata, and shot him, grazing him in his arm. Now, Girlfriend One would then strike Gene Morello with her vehicle and speed off. After the incident, Associate One Barella would report to Gialonzo, who found out that Cognata had not been injured, had been injured but not killed. Now, I will say this: I have spoken to two individuals that have said to me, "Gene Barella did not do that crime." I'm venturing to believe, and I'll believe the indictment that Barella did actually do that. So, again, this is a back and forth with Cognata. Now, down the road. Gialonzo allegedly, according to the same indictment, would order that girlfriend one's car be lit on fire, which it was. Though luckily, Chris Cagnata would escape this war. He would be arrested in September of 2006 on accusations that he stabbed a person called Joseph Dorigo. Ultimately, Chris Cagnata would be convicted on assault and robbery charges and be sent to prison in early 2007. And it's probably good that he was. Cognato was marked for death, and eventually, 
as we know with revolutionaries against the mafia, generally the mob wins in the end. So Cognata was likely saved by being sent to prison. Cognata would report in 2007, and he would be eligible for parole until 2010. However, he wouldn't get out in 2010. Cognata would be released from Attica in 2011, April of 2011. Cognata would head back to the streets of Howard Beach. Now, the thought would be, that would probably be a dangerous thought, wouldn't it? Cognata was at war with Ronnie G and the guys that essentially ran Howard Beach for the Bonanno crime family. But Ronnie G had his own problems. He was in prison until 2013 on a separate charge. It was said, though, that once Ronnie G. Alonzo got out, Chris Cognata approached Ronnie G and said basically he didn't want any beef anymore. He was moving on. And would he accept a basic apology to which Ronnie G squashed the beef? So we have to give Ronnie G the respect of the captain that he was. He definitely, I don't think, wanted drama, but he took the drama to the streets when Cognata wanted it. When Cognata came and put his tail between his legs, he decided, all right. I got a lot of heat on me from the federal government. And Ronnie G did by that point. There was a lot of heat coming down at him. He decides to say, we got no more beef with Cognata. Now, for the next couple of years, between 2013 and 2016, Chris Cognata would continue to be a criminal. It was said he was selling heroin, he was a drug dealer, and he was making moves in the streets. He never got away from that. Chris Cognata was born into criminality, and there was nothing else he was ever going to be. That would be until November of 2016. In that year, Chris Cognata would go to the area of 151st Avenue in Lindenwood, Queens, not far from the home that he had on 102nd Street. He would go to collect a debt from a person called Joseph Amatuccio. Amatuccio lived in a apartment with his girlfriend in that area. Cognata was going to collect a debt. A fight would ensue. EMS would be called where Chris Cognata would be found shot multiple times in his arm, neck, and chest. He was pronounced dead on the way to the hospital. At the time of his death, Chris Cognata was 30 years old. He was just a month shy of his 31st birthday. Amatuccio was subsequently arrested, and down the road, he would be acquitted of second-degree murder. However, he was guilty of weapons, possessions, and offenses, and sentenced to seven to nine years in state prison. In 2019, he would attempt to appeal his um, guilty uh, verdict, and that would render to be denied. Joseph Amatuccio currently sits at Wyoming Correctional Center in New York. He is eligible for parole in April of 2024. He is now 41 years old. The killer of Chris Cognata will eventually get out of prison, and we can venture to believe it was a beef over drugs. And Chris Cognata got what was coming to him in the end. Chris Cognata was a father. I believe he was a husband. And I will not downplay the fact that he is now dead. But the truth of the matter is, Crazy Chris, as they called him, was a criminal. And as they say, live by the sword, die by the sword. Chris Cognata always knew, probably in the back of his head, that a bullet likely awaited him at some point. He lived on the edge and in the end, died on the edge. When we look back, it's been nearly seven years since Chris Cognata died. In fact, next week will be the seventh anniversary of his death. And I have to wonder what the growing thought around Howard Beach is. I talked to multiple people, and I'm not talking about just informants in Howard Beach. They all told me the same thing about Chris Cognata. He was a lethal individual and very feared. But when we look back on his childhood, very few positive influences around him, it's no secret that he became what he was. And in the end, he was just another Howard Beach tale. Is he a legend? No. 
Is he a street legend? Yes. I hope you enjoyed this video. We'll see you next week here on The Sit Down.